A welcome into this week's Degrees of Science. When we deal with severe weather and any types of weather, you'll get watches and warnings that'll be issued. But where those watches and warnings come from and what all work goes into it, most folks may not know. Well, this week we're talking with Jennifer Dunn, the Warning Coordination Meteorologist from the National Weather Service in Fort Worth. Jennifer, when it comes to all this, first of all, just what's the difference for folks that may not know the difference between a watch and a warning? Uh, even the word watch versus warning causes a lot of confusion between people and, and I'm glad you asked that because we do get that question often or we notice that there is confusion. So a watch essentially means that conditions are favorable for that type of weather to happen. So let's assume we're going to be talking about a severe weather event. So you get a severe thunderstorm watch or a tornado watch it means that conditions are favorable for those types of storms to begin developing probably within an hour or a few hours later, depending on where you are in the watch box. So typically for most people, what we'd say is it's okay to continue with your routine activities, what you need to do that day. If you know it's gonna be later, maybe plan on being home or being in a safe place by, by that time. But also as you continue to go through the day when a watch has been issued, continue to check on the weather a little bit more frequently especially if those skies are getting darker or you start to see clouds build. Start checking your local weather sources to see what's going on. So when you have a warning that's issued for your area, that means that there is an imminent or an expected threat for severe weather or a tornado in the area that you have been alerted. So this is your time to take action. Don't delay, take those safety and preparedness actions to keep yourself, family, friends, whoever you may be with safe. Take shelter, get away from windows, whatever is required for that threat in the area. So when we're kind of at the beginning of the event or everything's kind of getting going, we just like you said, watches come out first. They're more for a broad area. In your office, what all work goes into a watch coming out for your forecast area? A severe thunderstorm or a tornado watch in particular, um, even flash flood watches as well, but particularly for severe thunderstorm and tornado watches, it's actually a collaborative effort with the Storm Prediction Center that's located in Norman, Oklahoma. They will kind of send their proposal of a watch down to all the offices that are impacted because as you mentioned, they cover very broad areas, um, larger areas than a typical warning. And so we'll all get on a collaboration call together, look over the proposed watch, make any changes, talk about what we agree about, what we even may disagree about that we need to keep an eye on for later. And then once everyone's agreed, we'll go through the process to having that watch actually issued and disseminated out, whether it's on web pages, broadcast media, on the TV, on radio, and on no um, all hazards weather radio also. So once that watch is issued, what, what all changes in your office to, <clears throat> excuse me, to kind of get ready for all that incoming weather? Overall, I don't think a lot actually changes in our office, but that's probably about the time that if we haven't called in our extra staff yet, or if they haven't quite made it into the office, we're gonna make sure that they're coming in because we're going to need extra staff during a severe weather or a convective event. So at that time, we're going to be looking at also providing maybe additional updates to our partners about what is happening, how are things evolving, what changes are we seeing in the environment? What changes are we seeing in the forecast? Um, could be something like we think storms are going to take another hour to form instead of um, you know 30 minutes that we we might have previously said as we're watching satellite and radar trends. So we might be providing a little bit more frequent updates, graphics also on social media as well, trying to keep people updated so they know what's going on as we get to the time period where storms are forming or moving into the area. All right, so now the storms are starting to form, stuff's becoming severe. What, what all process goes on in your office to put out severe thunderstorm or tornado warnings? So organized chaos is how you can describe our office. Um, we really don't have a whole lot of people. I think people think we have about 20 to 30 people that come in and, and work this uh, severe weather events, but our office really only has about 15 to 17 meteorologists. So we probably have about half of that in during a severe weather event, just based on the number of, of workstations we can have. And everybody has an assigned role and it's up on a whiteboard. Um, so everybody knows who's doing what. If somebody's coming in later, they can look and see who's doing what, or they can look and see what assignment that they are um, assigned to. So one of those roles, the one, uh, most important one you could probably argue is the radar operator. And that's going to be the person who has primary responsibility for watching the radar, analyzing, and making decisions about what warnings are needed when and where. 
Now we're going to have a support role for that also. There's probably going to be a second radar operator or somebody who's assigned kind of as backup uh, to that person, especially if they need to step away from the desk or grab something to eat, um, go to the restroom. We do still allow that when there are uh, warnings going on, but they're going to have, they're usually going to be operating some type of team format as well. So it doesn't necessarily mean that warning decisions are solely put the responsibility on one person. There usually is some team component with a second radar operator or maybe some others in the office as to what the best decisions for warnings is. Well, I'm glad y'all give restroom breaks and food breaks because when everything gets crazy here, we, we don't get that. <laughs> I'm stuck on the wall. I do feel bad for y'all for that. <laughs> and, and, you know, it is funny because people will ask us, you know, how many people you got covering? Well, there's only, we only have four meteorologists. There's a lot of times I'm the only one in here. Everyone else is running around. Uh, keeping an eye on uh, the storm. So yeah, I think uh, controlled chaos is probably the uh, best definition for that. So one thing that's changed, I've, we've both been in this business long enough that used to all the warnings came out as full counties, but now y'all do the polygons. Uh, I know y'all restricting kind of where it's going. How much lead time do y'all hope to give folks when it comes to severe thunderstorm warnings and tornado warnings? Well, the truthful answer is as much as possible, um, but there is a delicate balance as we're funding out through social science. I think our goals are about 15 minutes before the severe criteria or the tornado develops. That's about a good average time, but we can have much more um, lead time on that, especially for cities, towns, locations that might be further downstream from the storm. They may have longer lead time than that. But between the time that we issue the warning versus when it starts producing severe or tornadic activity, a general goal of about 15 minutes is um, is where we're at. And then we try to update about somewhere between 15 to 25 or 30 minutes, just depending on how the storm is evolving, to provide new fresh updates to people who are in the path of what may be coming at them. Now, throughout our warning process, um, if we need to, we can issue a warning fairly quickly. I can get a tornado warning out or anyone here if I had to within 30 seconds. It can be that quick. Our system is able to draw up a preliminary polygon. It has um, base text, kind of text formatted already in it. So I can make quick edits and ship it out in less than 30 seconds in maybe a rapidly evolving situation where uh, we're trying to get as much lead time. It's likely gonna be less than 15 minutes. And you were talking about the updates and that, that's one thing that's awesome with the new changes that y'all do at the Weather Service. Talk about how y'all can even change the style of warning, say for tornado warning from radar indicated to observed and really help us on the media side get out that vital information as stuff's changing, becoming more dangerous, potentially deadly. Yeah, there have been certain enhancements to our warning products, um, how we have format them in more of a hopefully easy to read bullet style, but also allowing us to add some additional information, not saying we couldn't before, but makes it a little bit easier to add some improved communication and additional information to it. So you're right, choosing what type of source is a big value to it because whether it's radar observed versus somebody that has actually seen it and is reporting it, knows it's going on, that makes a big difference to some people and to us as well, having that validation and that verification as long as you, as you mentioned, pushing out an enhanced messaging to the public about this threat that we know it's confirmed. And then depending on um, kind of the strength of uh, some of these storms, the type of severe weather it's producing or, or the size, whether it's, um, we know it's a, maybe it's a little bit of a stronger, uh, bigger tornado or it's larger size hail, we can add additional enhanced wording quickly into those to help with that message and pushing out that information. So you were talking about y'all having multiple people there with pre-assigned jobs. What, what kind of communication is your meteorologist doing with emergency management, media, and everybody while these storms are going on? So our communications role pretty much falls um, onto to two different ones. One of the ones that we have is NWS chat, and that is a closed internal chat system that we have with our partners in emergency management, public safety, and broadcast media as well, where all of those groups and amateur radio in some cases too, all of those groups are talking together about what they're seeing, what we're interpreting on the radar, where the threats are, what reports people have. And it's a, a constant two-way communication so that everybody hopefully has the same information and can share that information out with a, a consistent message. The other way that we are working on in communication, so that's usually one role dedicated to itself. The other one is uh, how we primarily reach the public is through social media. 
during these. We do post graphics on our web page, but we really go more rapid fire on our Twitter page in particular. And a lot of that has to do with because of the, the chronology of Twitter and, and how quickly um, it can you can get through uh, short short bits of information. So we do primarily go um, rapid fire on Twitter or more frequently on Twitter to keep the public updated. And the nice thing about our Twitter uh, feed too is that you don't have to have an account or be signed in to see it. It's publicly available so anybody could go on and see that and, um, and follow along with the latest updates wherever they may be in Central or North Texas. So you, you just mentioned Central and North Texas. Tell folks how big of an area your forecast office covers because you have a lot of counties in a very active severe weather area to keep an eye on. Yes, we cover 46 counties, uh, is what we call North and Central Texas. So we cover um, from a couple of counties along the Red River, down through Central Texas to, to Bell County and to Milam and Robertson County. So kind of along that line of, of Fort Hood there. We have a little bit into East Texas, or basically we're between Tyler and Abilene. So everything in between there, kind of in a square box, 46 counties is our coverage area. So it's not just uh, Central Texas. Um, on the media market too, we deal with North Texas, Texoma, East Texas, and a little bit of big country, and some of Austin as well. So a lot of broadcast partners to help us really spread the message of what the threats are and what safety actions people should be taking. So you got a huge area to cover, and again, a big severe weather area. And I know you've, you've been doing this job for a while, and you talk about controlled chaos. To tell some of our folks maybe one or two of the, the big events you remember and just how crazy it gets inside y'all's office, keeping an eye on those storms. So the first one that comes to mind will be uh, the day after Christmas, the December 26, 2015 event. I was one radar operator that day. Because of the scope of the event, the size of it, we actually had to sectorize into different parts of our area. And uh, I had everything east of 35, which is where a lot of the tornadoes were. And so everybody just has their assigned role. And you get to a point where there's so much going on that some of the smaller roles have to be dropped. Like I think in that case, we maybe weren't providing as much updates every 15 to 20 minutes as we would have liked to have because we had to pull that person who was doing that into be a radar operator over here from the cold front that was coming in. Most people probably don't remember there was a cold front coming in with storms also. So um, we sometimes have to split and shift and sectorize and redo our duties as we go through an event, trying to prioritize, of course, warnings, but communication plays a big role in that too. Making sure that our partners have the information that they need to protect their communities and also to, to share the information out so people can take those protective actions. That day after Christmas, the cold front, we were cutting in over the Sun Bowl and it was snowing in El Paso for the Sun Bowl. That's how crazy that weather day was for sure. So yeah, so, so tell, me, tell me another story. I'd love to hear what y'all build with. One more that I just thought of is gonna be April 3rd, 2012. That was the twin supercell, tornadic supercells moving right through uh, the DFW area. I had worked an overnight shift. I was woken up by a tornado warning going off on my phone and I realized that the event was unfortunately playing out a little bit different than we expected, but the office had been able to pick up on those uh, during the day and make Make those necessary adjustments too but it was quite an experience uh, to kind of be here in with that event and seeing the tornadoes moving through the DFW area so you know we end up with long days but I mean our our, our viewing area is just a section of y'all's so like take you back to the one this last winter the, the storms that started down here went all the way up into Oklahoma I mean we had storms that started here that produced off and on tornado warnings for 300 miles. How, how hard is it for y'all when you get these long duration major events that could last half a day or more? Yeah, for our coverage area, it's not uncommon for us to go from 3 p.m. to 1 a.m., you know, in some cases, maybe even a little bit longer, depending on how the system and, and the whole pattern is evolving. So we really have to make sure that we're taking care of our people. Um, we've got to make sure that we're staffed where we're not overloaded on one time and we're well covered on another time as well. And that's where pre-planning by our management team and our lead forecasters in particular in the days leading up to ensures that we have people set in all the times and duties and responsibilities that we need. So there's a lot of pre-planning that starts uh, a couple days before even. Well, you know, a lot of like, I uh, hope we educate a lot of folks, you know, you see the watches warnings, don't know exactly where they come from, but I do appreciate all the hard work y'all do because it does make our job easier getting that information out. But uh, Jennifer, thanks for taking some time to uh, kind of talk about that process of the, the watches and warnings. 
absolutely, Brady. Thanks for having me on. And we just can't say that we really can't do our job with getting this warning information out without our broadcast media partners. And we're so glad to have such a good working relationship with our Central Texas media partners to help us alert people. And we know that they're turning to them. So we want them to have the latest information also uh, at the broadcast uh, stations so that they can get people to safety when severe weather threatens in the area. Well, I appreciate it, Jennifer. Thanks again for jumping on with us.